Good evening, everybody. We want to thank you first for coming out for tonight's debate here at Western Carolina University. And we also want to thank the candidates as well for showing up and he being here tonight. Um, I'd like to first ask the candidates, Tom Hill and Mark Meadows, to take their place at the podiums here on the stage. And we'll get going pretty quickly here. Again, I'd like to thank our candidates, uh, incumbent Republican Mark Meadows. He resides in Jackson County and comes from a small business background. His Democratic challenger is Tom Hill, who has a doctorate in physics and is retired from the aerospace industry. He resides in Henderson County. I want to thank both of you for being here tonight. And I'd also like to thank the folks in our audience for, for being here and joining us for this debate and uh, ask that you please hold your applause till the uh, end of the evening if you can restrain yourself. Uh, the rules for tonight's debate are as follows. Both candidates will have two minutes to answer our questions, which have come from students here at Western Carolina University, the staff, and from the public. The candidates will then have one minute each for rebuttal. And I'd ask the candidates please try to stay within the time restraints, which are indicated by the lighted timers that are before you on your podiums there. At the end of the night, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. And Mr. Meadows has won the coin toss, so he has the choice of having the closing statement. He will have the last closing statement, and uh, of course, he has the first question as well. And let's begin. And this first question comes from an 11th Congressional District voter. If elected, re-elected in your case to the 115th House of Representatives, what would be the first piece of legislation that you will personally introduce and how will it affect the citizens of the district? Well, we've introduced a number of pieces uh, of legislation over the last uh, 18 months. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have three of those pass the House. Uh, we're hopeful that our fourth one will pass here in the coming weeks, which really deals with accountability. But for me, uh, one of the ones that is still out there that we've been working on in a real bipartisan way is one that was introduced by people here in the district. Honestly, over in Henderson County, we found that the Habitat for Humanity was uh, sucked up in the Dodd-Frank regulations. And what we found was here they were providing no interest loans to provide housing, and yet they were still having to comply with Dodd-Frank, with all the disclosures, with uh, all the appraisal requirements. So uh, I got, uh, got together, we introduced a piece of legislation, got together with G.K. Butterfield, uh, who is a Democrat from this state, uh, and we went to work on it. And I'm proud to say that most of it has been changed administratively. We still have a little bit to do, and so I'm hopeful that we move that, that through. Because the impact of that really is about uh, homes being built for those that are uh, really in need. Uh, the cost for compliance just for one affiliate in Henderson County was $5,000 a month. And so when you extrapolate that over uh, all the affiliates that we have nationwide, we're talking about $95 million. That's $95 million worth of houses that couldn't be built that were just in compliance. So that would be a priority for us that we would continue with if reelected. Tom? Yes, uh, it's hard for me to say just one, so I'll give you three. The first thing I will do is to introduce a bill to close these offshore tax loopholes. I am sick of them. The corporate, these mega-rich corporations are moving overseas and avoiding paying hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes every year. This nonsense has to stop, and it's time for Congress to act on it. Now, I know that as long as Mark and his group are in charge of the House of Representatives, I can't get it out of the House. I don't care who is in the House, I will introduce it. The second, th and, and it's very simple. People say, well, you can't, that's, uh, the tax uh, structure is so complicated. Oh, no, it's very simple. 
you pass a law that says notwithstanding any other provision to the tax code that the corporations must pay taxes on the basis of where they make the money and where they make the profit and not on the basis where they call their home office. I don't care where that is. It can be in the Cayman Islands. It can be in Wales or Switzerland. Wherever they make the money, that's where they pay the taxes. And so that's the first thing. Second thing I intend to introduce is a form of an immigration reform bill. This nonsense of, of thinking that 15 million uh, undocumented workers are going to voluntarily deport themselves back to uh, Central America after they risk life and limb to come here is, is absolute nonsense. And I intend, I intend to introduce a bill to rectify that, and I'll explain, hopefully have a chance to explain more about it later. And the third thing I want to do is, as Mark uh, tried to shut down the government, I will introduce a bill to cut off the funds for these never-ending Mideast wars. I am not opposed to humanitarian efforts. I will support a, uh, quarantine, a, a demilitarization of Gaza, but that's, those bills are what I intend. All right. Sorry I went over it. Mark, you have one minute for rebuttal. You know, really, in terms of closing the corporate loopholes, that's part of our jobs plan that we started with uh, some time ago. And so looking at closing those corporate loopholes, I think, is something that we can all uh, support. You know, when we look at that, uh, picking winners and losers is not something that the government should do. And whether, whether that is uh, any corporation, and we're seeing this inversion that happens right now with corporations that are uh, putting their headquarters somewhere else, the trouble with that, we see the Burger Kings and, and it uh, upsets us. But what we don't see are all the foreign uh, corporations that won't invest here because of our high corporate tax. And, and that's something that we need to address as well, just for American jobs. And Tom, you have one more minute. Yes, Mark's had two years to do that. I haven't had any time. If I get up there, I will do something within the first few months on this. As far as as far as closing, as far as the tax rate being too high, these deadbeats would not pay taxes if they were five dollars. They're not going to pay them as long as they can move offshore and avoid taxes. They will do so. They've shown that, and they put out these silly. Uh, uh, press releases that say another patriotic corporation has moved offshore. Absolute balderdash. They are, they are not patriotic. There's not one ounce of patriotism in them. And needless to say, they're not funding my campaign. All right. We're going to move to the economy and jobs. And this first question um, is many consider uh, they have cited growing inequality a problem in our country, and particularly in western North Carolina. Is income inequality a problem, and what role, if any, should the U.S. Congress play in alleviating it? And we'll change it up, and I'll let you address that first, Tom. Okay. Would you repeat the specific question? Sure. Uh, is income inequality a problem, and what role, if any, should the U.S. Congress play in alleviating that problem? Income inequality is a problem throughout our nation. And what is happening is that during the recovery that's going on now that started some time ago, virtually all of the gains and in, in monet monetary gains have gone to the upper 1%. The middle class is disappearing. Poor people are getting poorer. $7.25 an hour minimum wage is starvation. It has to be changed. We can change it. And, we, and if we raise the minimum wage and we put taxes on the corporation, make them pay their taxes, we'll use that money to create jobs. When we create jobs, rebuilding the infrastructure, these companies that have had their pick of poor employees because they can't get a job anywhere else will then come to work. Uh, will th these co corporations will then be forced to pay them a decent wage. I am, I am for the raising of the minimum wage. I want that very clear. I have no tolerance for people to say, oh, well, if you raise the minimum wage, you'll this and that and the other. Well, this will have bad and happen. Let's raise it and see. People this day and time, incidentally, $7 for a minimum wage, seven and a quarter, is about $14,000 a year. If you've got husband and wife both working for that, they can't make it. 
It's that simple. It's time to, and, and, and when you talk about income equality, today we have people who are rolling in cash. They, don't, they have so much money, they buy 14th century broken beer bottles for a million dollars. They buy corporate jets, everything you can imagine, and, and the poor people can't afford housing and food. And I'm sick of it, okay? Mark? What do you say to those questions? There are a lot of businesses today that are voluntarily raising wages to try and help those who, the, the employees that they feel are faced with inequality. What, what's your answer to this question? Well, I've, I've lived the American dream. I, I grew up very poor uh, and, quite frankly, uh, have, have uh, done without, and I've had plenty. And one of the great things about this country is that we're not trapped in where we are. Uh, what the government has done many times because of a number of the programs they have, and this is one of the things I think we need to fix in a bipartisan way. I think Democrats, Republicans need to come. We've trapped much of our poor in a cycle of what I call comfortable poverty. What we do is, is that we have them on, on different government programs where, where what we've done is, and we talk about raising the minimum wage, you know, and, and if we look at that, you know, I'll take four people out there. And really what we have to look at is if we've got four people, you're going to raise it to $10.10 .10 an hour, I've got to make a choice which person do I fire so I can give the other three people a raise. But, here's, but, here, but here is the other issue. Here is the other issue. Here is the, here is the other please, issue. Please, audience, please, the, the social respect for the candidates, please. Here is the other issue. And this is something that doesn't get talked about. The single mom, if she is making uh, minimum wage, actually makes $15,080 a year if she works 40 hours. And when, when, you, when she gets an increase, and let's say she got a $3 an hour increase, what happens is, is the benefits that she has currently get taken away from her at 90 cents on the dollar. So she doesn't even realize the $3 an hour raise or thereabouts because much of that is taken away with benefits that she loses. I didn't know that until I went to Congress. We had a hearing, and all of a sudden we started hearing. I said, well, no wonder there is this disincentive. We've got to fix that. That is something that I think we can fix and help people get out of that, uh, that trap that they're in. All right. Tom, you have one minute for a rebuttal. As long as Mark is saying raise the minimum wage, we're in agreement. We're not in agreement on the impact that that will have. The extra money will put more money in the, in the hands of people who spend every dime they have on goods and services, and it will spur the economy. It is the right thing to do, and we can do that. Mark says he lived the American dream. I live the American dream, too. We just wound up at different places, all right? Mm -hmm. I, I grew up on, we were dirt poor. I grew up in the end of the Depression in East Flat Rock, and my dad had an apple orchard, and it's all we could do to survive. Dad and mother drank hot water for breakfast because we couldn't afford coffee and tea, if you can imagine that. And so, so I went off to school, had got an advanced education. It has gi given me a good standard of living for most of my life. It's just that in my old age, I have, I have not been as fortunate as, as, uh, as Mark has in that he has made so much more money in, in speculative enterprises than I can. Mark, you have one minute to, as a rebuttal here. You know, really, it's about trying to work in a bipartisan way and, and care about the people that you serve. And, and I, can, I can tell you that each and every day, uh, when you go through the 750,000 people that I have the privilege uh, of serving, uh, what you hear are different stories, and, and the, the great stories that are encouraging to me are the ones that we can help are the ones, the, the veterans who we've reached out to to make sure they get their benefits, those who uh, are looking at disability benefits. When, when you start to work on, on those kind of things, but here, here's, the, here's the problem. Each and every time that we start to have dialogue, it's about redistributing the wealth. You know, there's a disincentive when we start to do that, when you start to take money from people and say, you've earned it, but let's give it to somebody else. I don't agree with that. All right. Next question. This one was submitted by an 11th Congressional District voter, and the question is, would you vote to raise the debt ceiling? Why or why not? Mark, we'll begin with you. 
you know, uh, at this current pace that we have right now, what happens with the debt ceiling that if we don't do anything, we're going to still see a debt of about $23 trillion. That's what's accounted for. That doesn't account for all the uh, what they call offline, Social Security benefits, Medicare, all of those other liabilities that are out there. If we have a path. Uh, just like you would have with a mortgage, a 30-year mortgage. If we have a path that will balance over time, certainly increasing that debt so that we can work that makes sense. The problem is that's not what we do. We continue to raise the debt over and over and over again with no plan to repay it, with really no accountability. And what happens is, is as we start to spend this money, uh, it goes nowhere. There's, there's over $106 billion, that's billion with a B, that the federal government has spent that we don't even know where it went. I mean, no accountability at all. When you look at that, you say, well, gosh, it adds up to real money eventually. So whether you're a liberal cause or a conservative cause, having that accountability on that. But we've got to have a plan to balance, because if not, we're, we're going to meet that point of no return. And it's fast approaching. You know, the economists here at Western Carolina uh, articulates it very well. We've got to have a plan to get it repaid to make sure that we don't end up like Greece or some other country. Well, that's the concern. Will we go bankrupt, Tom? Uh, would you vote to raise the debt ceiling, or why or why not? Mark didn't take his full two minutes. Do I get the other 30 seconds? <laughs> I, you bet. I, uh, I, you know, I, I hear all this talk, and there is no bipartisanship in Congress. Mark talks about that. It's a fantasy. Mark, Mark circulated the letter, got 80 signatures on it, that shut down the federal government because they wouldn't raise the debt ceiling. The problem with the, uh, the debt ceiling is that his group is also committed not to raise taxes. The way to make the budget balance is very simple. You make corporations pay their taxes. They paid 23 percent of the federal budget. When Dwight Eisenhower, a good Republican, was president of the United States, 23 percent. Today they're the richest they've ever been, and they pay about 6 percent. If they pay 23 percent and we put a small three hundredths of one penny on transaction tax on Wall Street transactions, the budget will balance. So the issue is not the issue is not uh, what Mark says. There's no path. Of course, there's a path. The path is to make these deadbeats pay their taxes. You know, if your if your budget doesn't balance, you're either spending too much or you're not taking in enough money. And in this case, we're not taking in enough money. And it's not going to happen as long as we have these right-wing extremists in charge of the government that are absolutely committed not to raise taxes. And I want to emphasize that corporations and small businesses are not the same. They hide under the mantle of we're all business. No, they're not. Small businesses don't have a ton, uh, a cadre of, of lobbyists to go to Washington and get special tax benefits passed. They don't have the option of going to the Cayman Islands. So we do have an option to balance the budget. And and Social Security is nowhere near going broke. It has a two and three quarter trillion dollar surplus, which the government has borrowed and doesn't want to pay back. All right. And Mark? Closing corporate loopholes, as Tom's suggestion, is that, a, is that an answer? Does that help to shore up the budget of this you deficit? Know, cer certainly it helps. And what we've got to do is close those corporate loopholes. But, you know, Tom's answer to balancing is to take more of the American hard way, uh, working taxpayer dollar. That's his answer to balance. Because what he said was just, we need more revenue. The real problem with that is, is that eventually, as Margaret Thatcher said, eventually you run out of other people's money. And what, what we need to look at here is really a plan to balance. If you taxed all those corporations in that top 1%, you still cannot balance the budget. The problem is not a revenue problem, it's a spending problem and we got to get it under control. 
what, is, what about that point? Is it a revenue problem? That's simply not correct. These corporations are, are evading taxes to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. The, the deficit in uh, uh, a year ago was $1.3 trillion. Well, if, you, if, you, if they paid 23% uh, of the budget, you would be raising about $900 billion in, from corporations. And so we can, and, and it's not on the backs of the working class. Heck, uh, we working people, we poor people, we're taxed to death. Every time we go to the grocery store, every time we go to, uh, to have our car uh, filled up with gas, every time we turn around, we are taxed. It's the wealthy that are escaping taxes. They're paying at rates of like 13% uh, if they're paying at all. That's what Mitt Romney paid, 13.5% on a $22 million income. I don't think anybody in here is making that kind of money. If you are, please get in touch with me. I'd like to. <laughs> I'd like to meet you, right? This, this was submitted by uh, Greg Landeman and Zachary Howard. These are WCU political science majors. The question, while both of you are running on platforms featuring fiscal responsibility, the 11th district is one of the more economically depressed in the state. How will you balance these claims of fiscal responsibility with bringing federal dollars to the district? And I think Mark had, you had the last question first, so I'm going to give this one to Tom. We start building the rebuilding the infrastructure, plain and simple. The we can to rebuild the infrastructure will cost estimated by the GAO about a hundred and forty five billion dollars. Oh, we can't afford that, say the right wings. Can't afford one hundred and forty five billion dollars. We paid a hundred and forty five billion dollars in one year to fight that war in Iraq. 145 billion. We could, if we took that money and spread it out over three years, we would create a, a, a million jobs in this country, and that, that a million jobs that pay a decent wage. Now, once we once we start, you look around us. We've got we've got roads that need rebuilding. We've got all kinds of problems here in the infrastructure. We need we need to do that. We also need to start some honest to God public works projects to, to clean up our water, to clean up the messes that have, that have been made in our environment. Uh, I suppose that the public's probably going to get stuck with the bill to clean up the Dan River, too, if we, if we blink once, right? So, so we have to, we have to st use g federal funds to put people to work in our district. We had the WPA here. I don't know if, uh, I don't know how many of you remember that. If you go to Newfound Gap up here, you'll see things that they built way back in the 1930s that are still here and that we enjoy this day and time. That's what we need to do. And uh, the problem with the right wingers, especially the Tea Partiers, they don't want the government to spend money. Don't spend money. It's a bad thing. No, you have to spend money to make money. And that's what any good businessman knows that that's true. You can't just sit back and keep cutting until you cut yourself out of business. And we can do that. All right, Mark. Balancing fiscal responsibility with uh, funneling money back to the district to support jobs. Well, Tom said a real key statement. He said any good businessman knows you've got to invest money to make money. The problem is the government's not a business. The problem is the government is not in it to make money. What they are are in it to, to provide the necessary infrastructure, perhaps, as we start to look at that. Now, I'm on transportation infrastructure. I deal with that on a daily basis. And, and really, the issue that we have is more with broadband than it is actual road. Now, granted, we've got to fix our bridges and hard surface. But let me tell you one of the other problems. When you allow the government to make choices on where our federal dollars go, it doesn't come to Western North Carolina. Let me tell you, part of your fuel tax that every one of you out there pays, you pump it in, and 20% of that goes to, to fund mass transit. 80% of that 20% doesn't come to North Carolina. It goes to six cities. It goes to Washington, D.C. It goes to New York. It goes to Boston. It goes to Chicago. It goes to Philadelphia, and it goes to San Francisco. Now, that is not equitable. That is, doesn't provide jobs here, and that's the problem. When you count on a government to do it, there are winners and losers, and normally history shows us that Western North Carolina is a loser. We've got to get jobs, real jobs, and the federal role in that is really to get regulations out of the way so the private sector can create jobs again. 
Tom, your rebuttal? I couldn't dis disagree more. I do agree that, that what North Carolina spends does not come back here, and Medicaid expansion is a great example of that. For every dollar that we would spend on Medicaid expansion, the federal government would spend in North Carolina $13.50. But we've got these never-say-die guys with their ideology down in, in Raleigh, and so they turn their noses down on, uh, uh, on Medicaid expansion, and a lot of people are going to die as a result of that and it's a disgrace and it's nothing but a spite now if there are problems in the law as mark points out we have to fix the law okay that's very simple and don't tell me that there that we don't have the evidence here in western north carolina of government funds we have the tva look at look at what we have how did we get that all right did, did we have franklin roosevelt wasn't born in western north carolina so you you when you look at it these problems are all imagined problems, they can all be fixed if we approach it with the right attitude. Mark, he talks about the, these responsibilities of government of sharing and that, that it can't happen. Your rebuttal? Well, I mean, if TVA is his shining example of, of a great government project, then he, needs, then he needs to talk to his president, President Obama. Because President Obama right now is saying we need to liquidate TVA because we can't afford it, because it's, it's not making any money. And, and it's really, from a wholesale standpoint, it sells wholesale power. It doesn't even have the more expensive distribution type, and yet it can't make money. And so what we have to start to look at is, is that generally, you know, he talked about clean water and all of that. I don't know who he's going to get to clean it up. We've got the EPA over here that hasn't cleaned up CTS in 25 years. You know, there's 953 Superfund sites that haven't been cleaned up out of 1,300. So that's a batting average of 250. It's not a good batting average, so I don't know who's going to do it. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. No, uh, no, I get 30 seconds, do I not? Um, it's up to you. I'm fine. Give me 30 seconds. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the TVA, when I was a child, TVA was very was a very prosperous organization, and and it the problems it has financially are the result of Republicans having starved it for funds for years. Now that's the simple truth. As far as as far as as uh, uh, you know these other problems, we can work these we can work these problems out. I uh, you know I don't know if Mark goes over to Hawassi Dam and Fontana or not. Those are pretty good projects from my point of view. And they're they're clean energy, right? So so I uh, uh, I don't know what he's, I don't know why he's uh, trashing TVA. I'm a big fan of TVA. The biggest thing we need is to fund it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's move on. These are questions directed to each candidate, and um, I'm going to start with Mark. There seems to be a lot of confusion over your role in the government shutdown of, of uh, 2013, a shutdown that, according to WCU economist Steve Morse, cost the region over $33 million in visitor spending. What specifically was your role in the government shutdown, and if you had to do it all over again, is there anything you'd change about that action? You know, truly, as CNN reported, that I was the architect of the shutdown. Uh, Tom has a copy of the letter, and nowhere in there does it say anything about a government shutdown. In fact, if anything, it says that we need to keep the funding from one part of a law that had not been implemented, which was the Affordable Care Act. Tom has a plan that says he wants to have a government shutdown over cutting the funds to our military, because that's, he said, you know, cut the appropriations for our military. And I I think that that is not responsible. But if we start to look at this, you know, here's, here's where we've got to come with. Did I write a letter? The answer is yes. Did I believe that the Affordable Care Act would, would be a problem in its rollout? The answer is yes. Did I believe that people would not be able to keep their health plan? The answer is yes. Did I also believe that they wouldn't be able to keep their doctor? The answer is yes. Did I believe that they would pay higher premiums? The answer is still yes. Did I believe that Harry Reid would be reasonable? That's where I was wrong. And if you want to suggest that this freshman congressman has more power than Harry Reid and can close down the, the government, so be it. I'm going to do a whole lot more for Western North Carolina if I've got that kind of power. Okay. 
You get two minutes uh, or to, to two respond. Two minutes. Yep. Okay. All right. That's a pretty good dance. All right. The, the truth of the matter is, regardless of what Hamark interprets the letter, it led to the shutdown. It led to the shutdown, and it was an uncompromising position. It was, it, Mark talks about bipartisanship and working together, and it was a group of Republicans who decided that they would hold the federal government hostage in order to defund Obamacare. They, they uh, essentially passed bills that, that overrode the ACA 40 times. 40 times they repealed it. They're just really sore losers. That's what the, that's what the bottom line is. Now, if the ACA is so bad, let's let it go to work and see what happens. From what I'm reading, there are of the order of 12 to 15 million people this day and time who have insurance that didn't have it when they, before the ACA was passed. So let's give it a chance. Now, as far as my comparison with military spending, I just want to take it out of the budget. There's a lot, there's a big difference between what Mark did and what I'm proposing. And yes, he was the architect of the shutdown. That's the truth of the matter. He got these guys signed up that they agreed that they would not raise the debt ceiling and re if the ACA was not uh, defunded. Now, I will vote, I will vote to, to stop these, this war spending. People say, well, it's going to be over. Is it? Eighty billion dollars is in the 2015 budget for Mideast contingency operations. Eighty billion dollars. I haven't heard a word about Mark taking some of that money away, or any of the rest of the Republicans. Well, my amber light is on. You have 15 seconds. I probably seconds. can say a lot more, but I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> Mark, you have a minute to re uh, offer a rebuttal. Uh, you know, it, it, Tom keeps talking about the fact that there is no bipartisanship. You know, I've, I've co-sponsored more Democrat bills than anybody in the North Carolina delegation except one, and that includes Democrats and Republicans. I passed through the House with a voice vote, unanimous, Republicans and Democrats, a bill that ha uh, dealt with human trafficking. I passed 404 to zero with the help of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a bill that, that goes after Hezbollah and terrorist organizations. So, you know, to characterize that there is no bipartisanship, that's not accurate. The, the, the other part of that, the other part of that that, that I would, would respectfully disagree is this economist that, that pointed out was using park service numbers. And I have great respect for him. He's a, a brilliant economist. But if you go, to the Department of Revenue website. And I encourage you all to do that for October of 2013 versus October of 2012. You will find that even during the government shutdown, we had a $30 million increase. Check it out. All right. Thank you, Mark. You have a minute have for a minute. rebuttal? Have a minute. All right. I I, uh, I don't dispute that. I probably misspoke there. There is great bipartisanship when it comes to dropping bombs and blowing people up. There's a lot of bipartisanship on, uh, with both parties. I'm looking for bipartisanship on things that, that affect our lives here in this country, like how, how to make jobs for people and how to get health insurance for people. There's no bi bipartisanship there. This, there. The right wing attack on the ACA is unprecedented. There's, no, there's been nothing like it. And so, so when Mark talks about, well, we've got all this bipartisanship, and, and I, you know, I, I can't keep up with all of these small bills, but I know this. I know that there are major issues before this country that are not being acted on, and it's our responsibility to do that. That's what Congress is supposed to do. This question is directed to you, Tom. If elected, you would be 76, year old, uh, 76 years old, one of the oldest freshman members of Congress in U.S. history, and simultaneously one with no experience in elected office. Why should the voters uh, elect someone with your lack of experience in elected office and at your relatively advanced age? Okay. Thank you. Good question. I'll tell you this straightforwardly. I am in excellent physical condition. I think that uh, uh, people that know me can vouch for that. I, I would point out also that if you look at 
uh, the major leaders in Congress, Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, none of whom are Mark's favorite people, Joe Biden, they're all within a couple of years of me. Uh, Dianne Feinstein is like four or five years older than I am. Now, as far as uh, if I were in poor health, it would be different. But I, God has blessed me with good health. I've taken care of myself, and I'm well-versed and well-educated, and I can do this thing. People say, well, you don't have any experience. That's exactly what we need in Washington. We don't need to be sending up there these politicians that go back year after year and learn how to be politically correct. I am not politically correct. I'm not politically correct. I don't even agree with my party all the time. And I don't support Obama all the time. I, but I will support him when he does something right. And I will not claim that he's a Muslim or that he was born in Kenya or any of that nonsense, OK? He is a, when he does something good, like he's trying to do, give humanitarian relief to these children that are coming across the border. And Mark's group wants to cut that off. He, he said, I need money. I need money to. Uh, take care of these children. The law requires that, that we house them until I can give them a year. And that's what the law requires. Oh, no, we're not, we're not ponying up on that. And I ask them, and these, these same Republicans, right wings, are the ones who claim to be Christian evangelicals. I ask them simply to look at the mirror and ask, what would Jesus do? Do you think Jesus would border and tell him to go home. I seem to recall that he, he made a statement like, suffer the little children to come unto me. And so it's, it's time that we acted with humanitarianism in this country. Mark, you have two minutes. Well, I'm, I'm not going to step in it. Ronald Reagan said he was not going to use Walter Mondale's youth and inexperience against him. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I taught my kids from a very early age to respect gray hair, because with a lot of gray hair comes wisdom. A lot of mistakes, too. But I've told my kids that that's what they need to do. And so, you know, age is not a factor. Uh, really, the, the problem is not Tom's age. It's his ideological perspective. I mean, he believes that what we need is a bigger government. We need more money. What we need to do is make sure, you know, uh, he talks about humanitarian aid. I, I voted on a bill. It would have over oh, almost $400 million for humanitarian aid. You know, where is it sitting? On Harry Reid's desk. He didn't, he didn't sign that. You know, and so if it's really about a heart, that's the problem. Harry Reid doesn't care. What he's doing is he's sitting on something that could actually take care of those kids. But the other problem is it's big business. You want to talk about those kids coming across? In May alone, 9,000 kids, most of them not from Mexico. They were what they call OTM, other than Mexican. And they came across, and they're getting paid. The coyotes get paid $5,000 per person. So it's big business. You know, they make more money trafficking people than they do drugs. And when we have that, we've got to stem the tide. We've got to close our borders and make sure that we have a secure border. And if we don't do that, we're going to continue to have the problem. We had it back in 84, you know, amnesty that he supports. We still are dealing with the problem today. And so if we want to have a debate about immigration, let's have a debate about immigration to talk about it and see how we need to do that. Tom, what about those concerns about human trafficking? Yes, One I have, have a minute here, right? Yes. First, I want to thank Mark for his comments about age. That's pretty much the way I see it, too. And he's, he's right about our differences being ideologies. We, we have a friendly relationship, and we just disagree on what the, uh, uh, on what the right role of government is. Now, as far as uh, human trafficking, I read where, a, where these kids in Central America, especially countries like Honduras and Guatemala, are forced into drug gangs at an early age. They come here to escape that. That's, that's where a lot of these kids are coming from. And I read where this uh, boy who came like uh, seven or eight years ago sent back $7,000 to his younger brother so he could come here. And so I, I know that there, you can call this trafficking, you can call it whatever you want, but I think that was pretty darn noble for him to do, to get it, keep his brother out of a drug gang. So I, I believe that we have to, I believe that we have to step up to this problem, and I, and I don't think we're doing it. 
Mark, you have one minute. Do we have a humanitarian role here? Can we help at the border? You know, certainly we can help at the border. We're already helping at the border. The real problem is, is across the country, people are starting to get busloads of people. They're coming to their, their schools and their health care clinics. We have them in North Carolina. We have them all over. And the reason we have that is because the message went out. And I've traveled to Mexico. I've met with the president of Mexico to talk to him about this very problem. The message went out is that if you get to the border, you can stay. They're not going to send you back. And, the, and when that message gets out, what happens is it creates this business. And, and you talk about human trafficking. My daughter has been involved in human trafficking since age 15. It's very personal to me. She, she brought it up. We passed a piece of legislation. Each and every time human trafficking comes up, it's horrific. But for every story that we have of someone that was caught in drugs, it is really a minor story about big business of people taking advantage of kids, and that's what we have to stop. We're going to move to foreign policy now, and this question is uh, about the current situation overseas in the Mideast. What role should the U.S. Congress have in stopping international terrorist organizations such as ISIS? And we'll begin with you, Mark. Well, I think this week is a sober reminder that the war against terrorism continues on and uh, with the tragic beheading of a second journalist. But that's not just the story. It's a story of it happened in the Capitol a few weeks prior to that. I had a number of, of Iraqi people come to my office. And they talked about hundreds of thousands of Christians that were being slaughtered. Kurds being slaughtered, Christians being slaughtered. And they said, you know what? The administration is not doing anything. They're not doing anything. The French are doing things, but the United States is not doing anything. Can't you help us? And so four members of Congress, yes, in a bipartisan way, got on, on the phone and talked to not only USAID, but the State Department. And the person that gave them the hardest time was a Democrat because she kept coming back at it and said, this is not just right. Talk is cheap. You need to get something going. Because supposedly we were monitoring the situation. This is a situation that requires action. And why does it require action? Not just because of the Christians in Iraq or in North Africa or in the Sudan, but it's coming back home. You know, the headlines recently talked about a guy wanting to join ISIS from Salisbury, North Carolina. It is right here in our backyard. There are cells here. When you look at Charlotte, we had Hezbollah share, uh, cells here that looked at blowing up the courthouse and send out a death threat against those that prosecuted him. We have got to stand up. Cutting and taking an indecisive wait-and-see approach is not what we need to do. Cutting the military is not a way to do. We don't have to put boots on the ground. We've got Kurds that can handle it there, but we have to make a decisive action, and we need to be firm in it. That's, that's a real humanitarian response. Tom, your we, position? We have over 1,000 contractors in Iraq today serving in a military role. We now have 1,300 American troops on the ground in Iraq. And so I am not, uh, uh, I don't share Mike's, uh, Mark's point of view on this, obviously. And I would point out that these ISIS criminals are the same ones that the hawks, the Republican hawks and Democrat hawks, wanted to come to the aid of against Assad. Assad was killing those guys. We have to go in there. Those people are being slaughtered. How bad it is. Look how he's gassed these guys. It's just awful. And then those people that we went in to help, they're, they turn around, they're beheading our reporters. All right? The same ones. The people that, and so we don't know what we're doing in the Mideast, and, and one day the Republicans want out, and the next day they want to impeach Obama for not going in. It's a flip-flop, and we don't know what we're doing. We need to get out of there. We need to give humanitarian aid to people who are fleeing from, the, from these wars. I will support going into Gaza and demilitarizing Gaza with NATO. I was, those are the two military actions, I, two types of actions I'll support. The other is to get out of the way of these sectarian people. We made the Taliban 
Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. made the Taliban. The Russians invaded Afghanistan. They came in, and we said how awful it is. Those poor people in Afghanistan are suffering under the Russians. We, we got the CIA over there. We, we taught them how to fight. We gave them weapons. Man, that light comes on quick. We gave them <laughs> weapons. We taught them how to fight. We do that over and over again, and we say, what went wrong? What went wrong? What went wrong is we don't have an exit strategy. We jump into these things. We're good at bombing and, and tearing things up and killing people, but we're not very good at, at beyond that. Mark? Well, I, d I disagree with Tom. I knew foreign policy like the back of my hand. I've met with 89 ambassadors. I've met with the ambassador of Iraq. I've, I've truly uh, been a student of this since I've, I've gotten to, to Washington, D.C. And I can tell you, inaction is not what they respect. They respect the fact that we need to take decisive action. That's what they want us to take. You know, when you start to say that, you know, that this ISIS is of our own making, that's not accurate, Tom. I mean, we had 1,500 people when ISIS was there. We could have gotten rid of them not more than 18 months ago at 1,500 people. Now they're up to 20,000, and they're getting al-Qaeda affiliates from all over the world to back them up. you gotta, you got to deal with it today decisively or we're going to be dealing, dealing with it with the blood of our men and women in the future if we don't deal with it today. I get a minute. Well, Tom, people say they're coming to our country. How do we defend ourselves? Yeah. Uh, What's the best way? I got a minute here. Yes, right? sir. Okay. I, uh, what we're doing is we're building a, we're, we're building a training ground for terrorists. That's where that, they go there. These guys from the United States who are half nuts go over there to get their training, all right? They, that's what they're there for. They, they're, there are these lunatics who enjoy killing and dying, and, and if I blow myself up and take 30 people with me, I, why the world will stand up and cheer, okay? The only thing going to cheer is, or the, uh, you know, the only thing that's going to take notice is, is the bomb that goes off. I mean, it's, it's just idiocy as to what, what these people are doing. Now, we are providing a training ground. We're providing a training ground over there for them, and I want that, I want that that to stop. Ask the people at the Boston Marathon if they thought fighting those wars over there made them any safer. The Russians knew who the terrorists was and our own, who the terrorists were and our own intelligence did not. I could not disagree more and we need to stop it. Okay, the next question. This, this year we have seen tremendous unrest in Ukraine. While this may have clear implications for Eastern Europe. Some are unclear on the potential impact in the U.S. Is the unrest in uh, Ukraine posing a threat to the United States and how, if at all, should the U.S. respond to this ongoing situation? And we'll begin with Tom. We need to divert Putin's interest. Uh, he, uh, he wants to rebuild the, uh, the USSR. That's what he really wants. And so he is trying, we have to realize that Ukraine for many years was a part of the Soviet Union. There are a lot of Russian people, Russian speaking people in the Ukraine. And we think that we have to, we think we have to fix everything in the world. We, we can't, uh, well, we've got a war going on over here in Israel. We've got another one going in Syria. We've got one going in Iraq. And, and there's one about to get going in, uh, in Ukraine. And we can, we can handle all these. We can't handle all. What we need, and, I, and, and the Hawks would never agree to this, we need a coalition with the Russians. The Russians have the largest standing army in the world. We spend more money on military, military systems than all of the rest of the world combined. It is a natural coalition for us to have a to operate with the Russians. I would remind you that it was the Russians who stepped in and got those chemical weapons taken out of Syria. The Russians can be worked with and I would for one and and you can call me nutty if you want to. I would call up the, uh, if I were president I'd call up Putin I'd say would you like to take our place in Afghanistan? Afghanistan if you would we've got some equipment over there we'll give you and we and and if 
leave, and we'll be just very happy to see you move in. So we need to divert the, uh, the Russians' attention. Now, as far as, as far as the conflict itself between Ukraine and the Soviet Union, w I mean, Russia, we wouldn't stand if, if uh, Mexico joined the Warsaw Pact. We wouldn't stand for it, all right? And that's exactly what we've been pushing for you for the Ukraine. I, I sympathize with those people in Ukraine, but they're going to have to work out their own problems. They have tremendous economic problems there, too. Somebody's got to step up with several billion dollars. All right. Well, Mark, is the Ukraine posing a threat to the United States? And how? Certainly it is. I mean, I guess my question is, is, is so the national policy, security policy that Tom is proposing is that we form a coalition with Russia. I, I don't understand that. And, and, I mean, you know, here has been a Cold War threat. Here is a president who said, after the election, I can be a lot more flexible. And what we're seeing is, is that Putin understands that he is a KGB guy. He knows how to negotiate. He knows that we won't call his bluff. So here's how we do it without boots on the ground. And the answer is, is really not sanctions, because sanctions take way too long to do and they, they don't have the impact. The, the answer is liquefied natural gas. And what happens is we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time exporting liquefied natural gas from here, get all the old Soviet bloc countries off of their reliance on Russia, because that's really how they have the power. He knows that he can turn off the spigot any day to Germany or to the Ukraine or to Hungary or to Estonia or any of the others. And let me tell you, our allies are worried. I've talked to many of them. They said, you know, he's coming after us. First it was Crimea, now it's eastern Ukraine. He said he could take Kiev in two weeks. He is a real threat. The only way to get him without shedding blood is to do it economically. When, when Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down these walls, it was two things. One, we had a strong military and, and they knew that we could do what we needed to do. The other was economic. We spent them into the ground. They didn't have the economic capability to continue on. We need to go after his economy. If we start and mean it about exporting liquefied natural gas, the price of oil comes down. If it gets down to $70 a barrel, he has an economic problem and he withdraws. Tom, do you believe you've got one minute? Economic policy could help? Uh, how much time do I have here? One minute. With due respect to my friend Mark, what a line of bull. The, the, the impetus behind liquefied natural gas is to make money for companies that want to export gas from fracking in the United States to, uh, to some customer. And they found one in Ukraine. That's what's behind it. The rest is nonsense. What we need to do is to learn how to get along with other countries in the world that do not have governments like ours and do not share our ideologies. We can work with Putin. It's, it was shown in Syria that we could work with him. We need to pursue such avenues, and we're not going to because people like Mark and the Republicans and the Hawks regard Putin still in the Cold War frame of reference, and that's gone. It's a new age, okay? Mark, would your plan and the threat of fracking be a concern? You know, really, when, when we look at fracking, this is not a fracking issue. We've got a 500-year supply of natural gas. 500 years, more, twice as many as we've been here in existence. And if we start to tap that, instead of flaring off a lot of it, if we start to export it, we would do two things. We would make the environmental uh, support of Tom very happy because we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The EPA even said that. We've reduced greenhouse gas emissions by over 5% because of the transfer from coal to natural gas. So what's wrong with that? Let's get them off of Russian oil onto the United States liquefied natural gas and make some money in the process and put people back to work. All right. 
make we're, money is right. We're going to move to domestic policy. Well, is making money wrong, Tom? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's not. We're moving into domestic policy as we're running out of time. I want to squeeze in a few more questions before your closing statements. This one, the world has recently seen and been focused on Ferguson, Missouri. What should Congress's role be, if anything, in preventing strat or tragedies like the shooting of Michael Brown and the ensuing riots and violence that have plagued uh, this town? Mark? You know, I enjoy one of the best relationships I think that a member of Congress can enjoy with our law enforcement community in all 17 counties. That's Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated, whatever they are. And I can tell you that if Washington, D.C. would operate the way that our law enforcement officers operate in this district in terms of really working hand in glove with one another, we would be in a better, better state. That said, we need to trust the rule of law, and we need to trust our law enforcement officers. Let me tell you, we've got great sheriffs all the way around. I know all 17 of them. And so when we start to look at those sheriffs or police chiefs, let them make the best decisions. And what happens is, is each and every day, they risk their life, Frank. I talked to somebody the other day for $12.70. A police officer is risking his life going out. And what we need to make sure is that we stand by them. You need to thank them. I encourage each one of you to thank those law enforcement officers that are out there. I stand with them, stand with their decisions, and quite frankly, I know that those kind of problems are not the kind of problems that we have in Western uh, Carolina, and I'm thankful for that because of the integrity of the law enforcement officers that I have the privilege to serve with. Can you show up on the 22nd of September? Yeah, please. Let's, no. let's please contain yourself. I can tell you're an undecided voter, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Tom, uh, you have two minutes with that question um, about Ferguson, Missouri. It's, it's unfortunate that racism is still alive and strong in the United States. Now that's a fact. I lived in California when Rodney King was beaten. I saw it on, I saw the film on it, and his head was, they were hitting him in the back of the head with a nightclub, and they were hitting him so hard, his cheekbone was bouncing off the pavement. And when the officers involved in that melee were brought to trial, the jury sent a question to the judge and wanted him to define the word beating. Now that's the kind, and, and what it is, we have, yes, I stand behind police officers. We have good police officers in most of the places in our country, but there are exceptions where, where racism is being practiced and it has to be stopped. And if the, if the local police won't do it, we need to send in the uh, federal troops, uh, federal uh, authorities, not troops, federal authorities under the Civil Rights Act. And that's what we did for Rodney King, and we put those guys in jail. Now that's what needs to be done here from what I have seen. I, I was not there. I have not seen all the details, but I can tell you it has all of the, it has all of the trappings of racism, and I don't like it. And, they, and if you look at the makeup of the police force, there's only a tiny fraction of that police force in that area that's black. The vast majority are white, and, virtually, and the vast majority of citizens are black. I, I do not, uh, uh, I don't want racism on either side. I don't want reverse racism, but when these things come up, we always take a jaundiced look if we're white. We say, well, you know, if we, if we look at it from the officer's point of view or look at it from uh, uh, the guy that, uh, 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 that got his head uh, slammed on the ground by that concrete, uh, you know, it's a different thing. No, racism is racism. It's ugly, and we see it against Obama every day of the week where we live, and that's, that is the sad truth. Mark, you have a minute, and Tom pointed to the Justice Department getting involved. They are involved in this case as well. Do you think that's appropriate? Yeah, this is not a issue of condoning racism or not, because no one should condone racism, and uh, I certainly don't. But for us, a group of 200 people here tonight, to try it based on headlines that we read or based on what's reported on MSNBC, CNN, or Fox, depending on what you watch. For us to try that is convicting our law enforcement officers 
of, of a great tragedy that may or may not have been their fault. I went to a funeral of Jason Crisp, and he gave his life defending you. You know, it could have been different circumstances, but the hardest thing I had to do is console a, a wife, a mother, and two sons, you know, of the loss of their, of their husband. So I'm not going to condemn them from a thousand miles away. I'm going to stand by them. One minute, Tom. With regard to Rodney King, I saw it on TV. I don't think there was never any doubt in my mind as to what really happened there. I don't think anybody contested the facts. It was a question of what you thought that that did that constitute a beating. I've seen this over and over again. I've seen it. I saw it work in reverse in the case of uh, O.J. Simpson. I watched that trial. I was working as a consultant at the time, and I watched that, and that was racism in reverse. And, but it's up to us as reasonable people to, to, to insist that race not be a factor in these, in these, uh, in, in these events. And I think we have a duty, and I, I, I don't uh, uh, share Mar uh, Mark's position that, that we can just sit back and let the police do their job and everything will be all right. I don't agree with that. Next question. This question in part also comes from a voter. Please clarify your position on the Affordable Care Act. And, and let's get past support and oppose here, but what specific provisions make the ACA good policy or bad policy? And we'll begin with Tom. The ACA is not at all what I wanted. I wanted a very simple public option that would have gone like this. It would say that if you have an insurance policy that you like, and it meets federal minimum requirements, which means that you can keep your child on the policy till he's 26, that the insurance company cannot cancel the policy because you uh, have an illness and that they can't put a cap on it and a few other little things like that. If you have a policy like that and you want to keep it, more power to you. You can have it. Now, if you don't have that policy, if you don't have that policy, we're going to sign you up for a government policy that's like Medicaid. We're going to sign you up. It's going to be taken. If you're not retired, it's going to be taken from your pay, just like Social Security, and you're going to be covered. And when you go to the hospital, you will have the same basic coverage as a, uh, as a Medicare type. A patient. Now that's what we needed, a very simple public option. But as usual, the money makers got involved. Obama tried to accommodate them and put all this 20% profit margin in there. And so of course the, the rates went up. All right, and it and and we had so many things in the ACA that are, that are not good because it's such a kludge. We didn't need a 1,200-page document. That's about what it is in in, in legal uh, type. And and so it's, But now, having said that, having taken my shots at the ACA, it's the best that we got. Mark's group had a chance to fix it, make it better. Not one of them signed up, signed on the ACA. They they didn't offer any suggestions. All they did was try to block it, and they're still trying to block it. So, it's, so I, I say it's the it's a best we've got at the time, and we will fix it. That's what, that's what Ted Kennedy said, too. Reveal it! <laughs> Mark, your, your thoughts on a public option? Is that a possibility? Well, I, I want Tom to answer one question, since not a single Republican voted for it and big money got involved with ACA and messed it up, which Democrats did big money get involved with. I mean, I mean, the, the, the fact is, not a single Republican voted for it. So if big money messed it up, uh, let's, let's find out who they are. And so, uh, you, want it now? But I, I, you got one minute of rebuttal, you can answer it then. And so I, I've been very clear. You should have been able to keep your policy like the President c promised. You should have been able to keep your doctor like the President promised. It should have been cheaper like the President promised. None of those things were true. Now that it's here, now that it's here, and repeal is not uh, looking probable. What we need to do is find some ways to make sure that we fix some of the problems. One of those answers came right here from Western Carolina, from your chancellor. Sitting in his office, he said, you know what we need to do? 
is we need to make sure that student workers don't get caught up in this because it's going to cost us millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, they're going to have to go without jobs because we can't afford to do that. And many of these students are working jobs to pay for their tuition. So what did I do? I went back and drafted a bill, a bipartisan bill, a bill that actually not only the University of North Carolina President Tom Ross supports, but a number of universities across this country su support. So when you talk about there's not bipartisan, I find the best ideas come from right here in my district. And that's one thing we need to do. We need to get rid of this 15-member uh, appointed board that's going to decide who gets health care and who doesn't. We need to get rid of that. And we need to make sure that, that a, a health care decision is between a doctor and a patient, not the government. Tom, where's the big money come from? Yeah, yes, first, the last question first. For, yes, we do have death panels. They're called insurance companies. And we do have them, okay? Second, the, the, uh, the ACA was written by Elizabeth Fowler, former, uh, former chief lobbyist for WellPoint. Washington is floating in lobbyists. She sold her services to Max Baucus. She wrote the bill. Most of the people did not even know what was in it. And when she finished, when it, when it was passed, she moved into the basement of the White House and became President Obama's chief advisor on, on, the, health, on the ACA. And yes, there are Democrats who are culpable. They, they're capable of being bought, just like Republicans are capable of being bought. And, and so we failed, but we can fix it. The problem with Mark's group, they don't want to fix anything. They just want to throw it out, and we'll start all over, and we'll have all these people out there dying that don't have any care. And sorry, my time is up. Mark, one minute. You know, I offer one thing that we're looking to fix it. We're also looking at health savings accounts to make sure that we can fix that. But when, you know, when we get about this, we talk about government providing health care. It hadn't been working too well for our vets. You know, when you have a waiting list for our vets, when that's happening there, that's a government program. And you know what I was told by the undersecretary? Everything's working fine until the news broke about deaths. You know, what we need to make sure of is, is that we, we make sure that health care is indeed affordable and that everybody has, has a, an opportunity to do that. But a government program that spends over $600 million on a website that didn't work, you ought to be worried if they're doing brain surgery is all I can say. <laughs> All right, this is going to be our last question yes, before we move to the closing is there a statement. Is second option here? If you'd like 30 seconds, I can I like 30 second option. All right. I keep hearing all this talk about we've got a plan, boy, we know what. Where the hell is it? Okay? I keep waiting. Mark, Mark spoke to, our, to the town hall group at Blue Ridge Community College two years ago, and he was asked about what is the Republican solution. And he said, Tom is sitting on Harry Reid's desk. That's where it is. It was, That's where it is. <laughs> Where it is. Where it is. I said it's sitting on Harry Reid's desk. That's where it is. Uh, uh, well, please send, please send me a copy, and I'll try to get in touch with Harry Reid. I hear all these promises, and I hear all of this, and, and Mark's got all this wonderful legislation he's passed. I don't see it. And I, I'm, and I really do study on the Internet. I'm not, I don't meet with ambassadors, but I, I read a hell of a lot, and I'm fairly well educated, and I think I know what's going on in the world. Mark, I'm going to give you 30 seconds if you'd like. Uh, I think it speaks for itself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this is the closing question, um, and this one is to you, Mark. There will be a public forum at WCU on fracking in just a few weeks. Some argue that fracking brings considerable jobs, potential energy independence, and few environmental hazards, while others argue that fracking can damage the environment irreparably, including potentially harming tourism in this part of our state. What's your stance on this issue on fracking, and what should Congress's role be in this debate? Really, Congress doesn't have a role as it relates to fracking. I mean, it's, that's a state issue that that really the state has weighed in on. Uh, fracking is, is not a viable option in western North Carolina. I, you know, whether you, you're for it or against it, it's just not going to happen. Now, I can tell you when there is fracking, what we do see are increased jobs, 
You can go to North Dakota. You pay $17 to work in a, in a McDonald's. You can pay $600 a night to stay in a Motel 6. You know, when you start to look at it, they have actually uh, unemployment that is positive. They're having to bring people in to actually work. So does it create jobs? Without a doubt. But, you know, really what we have is we've got an energy problem. And we, we can talk about minimum wage, we can talk about all these other things, but when a single mom is having to fill up her tank and go to work and having to fill it up at 350 a gallon, that really puts an impact on whether she puts food on the table, because it doesn't stop there. Every bit of food that goes on her table is affected by the price of gas. And what we've done is we, we have become energy snobs thinking that we can have solar that provides it all. I was around when the, the energy department was started, and we had a, an aggressive goal of 5%. We have 674 federal programs that support sustainable energy, and we're still at 7 to 10% of our overall energy consumption. We need to get gas prices down so that single moms and people on fixed incomes can have a pay increase. That's, that's a real pay increase. Tom, your thoughts on fracking? Two minutes, Congress's right? Role. Two minutes. Two minutes, sir. I am so confused. Mark said a while ago that we have a surplus of natural gas. We don't need fracking. Now he says we do fracking. It's going to it's going to lift us out. It's going to make money. It must be a market for it somewhere. Okay. So I don't understand how do we have a how do we have all this surplus and we still need to frack. Now I want to say that this fracking is a federal issue at its inception. It was, uh, it was uh, Dick Cheney who met with uh, various groups and got fracking exempted from the purview of the Environmental Protection Agency. And that is the root of this problem. It never should have been, have been left to these, uh, to these uh, guys down in, uh, biased guys down in Raleigh or any of the, Georgia or state capital or any of these other places. It should have been decided in Washington, D.C. Fracking should have been subject to the EPA rules like everything else that goes into the ground. And it was wrong from the beginning. The, on two occasions, we, the Democrats have introduced measures in Congress to repeal that portion of the law that exempts fracking, and both times it has died. So I can tell you that that uh, that this idea that that it's not a federal issue is nonsense. It should have been. It's a fe, it is a national issue. Should have been solved at the national level, and it was not. Now, as far as oh well, we don't need to worry about it here in North Carolina. After all, these good people in Jackson County got up in arms. Uh, we're going to we're not going to do that. We're not going to proceed uh, with this fracking. We're not going to proceed with it until after the election's over, and then we're going. And then we'll be right back in there. Anything that makes money, just look at it with a jaundiced eye. And I and and there are places to make money, but on but by contaminating our drinking water is not one of them. Mark, a lot of communities are concerned about the environmental impact. You have a minute here for rebuttal. You know, I, I'm concerned about environmental impact. The EPA uh, continues to roll out regulation after regulation many that are going to hurt our farmers when it comes to some of the new regulations that are coming out. And you know what? They double speak. They say this is not going to expand any of our regulatory authority. Then my question is, why pass it? If it's not going to expand anything, if it's not going to do anything, why pass it? Well, they continue to roll it out. I would be willing to look at the EPA when they clean up the CTS site that's in our backyard, when they get it cleaned up, because they're not even talking about months, they're talking about years and years, it's been 25 years, when they can handle a known problem, then maybe we can go after the unknown problems. 30, 30 seconds. I think, yeah, you do. 30 seconds. I, my question is, Mark, you've been up there two years. What have you done about the CTS? All right? If you've done anything, I don't know what it is. All right? You, you met with a couple of people, and then they came back, and they said, Mark's going to help us, and they came back say, Mark's not going to help us. So I don't know what Mark's done about CTS. As far as, this, uh, as, far as the uh, fracking issue in general, it's a federal issue. I repeat myself, and it has to be solved at, at the federal level. Level. 
Well, I, I'll, I guess I get yeah, to respond. Yeah, you can have a 30-second uh, to respond. Uh, respond. Yeah, he's, to he's addressed the, the question yeah. about uh, He does a lot of research on the Internet, so he right. just needs to go and look at YouTube, put in CTS, Mark Meadows. He'll see a number of hearings, but more importantly than that, he'll see that the inspector general has come in to open up an investigation. I get weekly reports from the EPA on what progress they're making. For the first time ever, we've actually got remedial action that is, is about to start. We have people that have been relocated for safety purposes. None of that would have happened. We started that. Our staff, our great staff started that early on when we, we were there, and there hasn't been a month that has gone by that we haven't addressed it. And so uh, for him to suggest uh, he just hadn't done his homework. I've talked to Tate McQueen instead, who lives at Tate the Tate McQueen's running for Congress. And he lives at the site. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go to the closing remarks then. And we're going to begin with you, Tom. Mark will have the final statement. You have two minutes. Thank you. I've written this out uh, so that I can fit it in my two minutes. And here I go, folks. We who believe in government of the, of the people, by the people, and for the people must take back our country. It has been hijacked by mega-rich people and corporations who are dodging their just taxes by, setting, uh, by selling disgruntled people on the idea that all government is bad. They push the nation into wars to protect their interests in foreign countries, make ludicrous amounts of money on the conflicts, and then re refuse to pay any part of the taxes to fight these battles. They use donations to re-election campaigns to bribe our legislatures to place loopholes in the tax code which allow them to pay a pittance in taxes or none at all. They use a small fraction of this money uh, to dis disseminate propaganda and outright lies uh, such as uh, trickle down. It was a lie when it was told in the 1980s and in its present form cutting taxes for corporations creates jobs is still a lie. And so we are falling for this. Uh, uh, the problem is that we the people are partly to blame for this. We fall for this nonsense. We let them get it by. You ask the people who, uh, that you meet who was responsible for the shutdown in, in uh, fall of last year, and they say, gee, I don't know. Some think it was the Democrats, and th some think it's Republicans. They don't know. And you ask, them, you ask them what's going on about fracking, and they say, well, I don't really know what fracking is about. And so we have to get the message out. I am a fighter who is willing to take on the establishment. I have done this throughout my life, and on, and on some occasions it has cost me dearly. But by, by the grace of divine providence, I have always managed to survive and keep fighting for what I believe is right. I am in a David versus Goliath battle here, and I am not Goliath. I need all the support I can get from people in this region who are willing to volunteer for my campaign. I also need some funds. I've, Mark's got like one point, he had $1.2 million in, back in uh, 2012, and I don't know how much he has now, but I'm sure it's at least that much. I, I have not we have, have to wrap it up. no money. Sorry. All right. I, I'm Thank sorry you. I took Thank you, Tom. I was being generous there. We're closing. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I want to thank Tom for your time tonight. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Frank, for moderating. You've done an excellent job. And a real shout out to Western Carolina University. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a great university, the greatest untold story in Western North Carolina and all of Carolina. And so it's, it's been an honor to be here tonight. You know, I had a prepared speech, but I think I'm just going to speak from my heart. And what I am very thankful for is all the problems that may be the disagreements that we've had here tonight and all the headlines that have been negative. There's a lot of good that's going on in Western North Carolina. You know, I left McDowell High School this morning after visiting with teachers and people that are believing that training the next generation is what it's all about. We've got some great teachers. We've got some great firefighters. We have got great law enforcement. We've got great construction workers. We've got unbelievable things that are happening. But really what's happening is the community is coming together to really support one another. And I want to tell you a story about Haywood County. A Democrat sheriff. A Democrat county commission. But that whole group has come together. Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated. They've all come together 
to provide for a halfway house, to make sure that those that are unfortunate get a helping hand up. That's the kind of thing that we need to be celebrating. And what we need to make sure of is each and every day that we celebrate the successes. Don't let the differences of opinion that divide us make us forget that this is the greatest place on the face of the world. That America, and being an American, not a Republican or Democrat, but being an American is what it's all about. I've had the honor to serve you. Constituent services is really what it's all about for us. Those stories are key. If I have the honor to serve you again, we will redouble our effort and do our very best to serve you in a God-fearing and humble way. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. And I'd like to thank both of the candidates, Mark Meadows and Tom Hill, for making this debate possible. I'd also like to thank Chancellor David Belcher, Professors Chris Cooper and Todd Collins for pulling it all together, and WLOS News 13 for agreeing to stream tonight's debate. I'd like to remind you all that this is part of an election debate series. The next one is September 23rd between Joe Sam Queen and Mike Clampett, and the following will be October 2nd with Jim Davis and Jane Hips. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Have a great night, and God bless.